Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon for me. This is I am Patricia de la Garza, and you're going to be seeing here what we've been calling for the past, gosh, 15 years, the Wizards of Ox. So we have been um, with Susan supporting her research and really believing what she's done. And we've been living a lot of this low oxalate uh, lifestyle for a number of years. And we would just like to welcome you and explain a little bit about what this um, idea that we have is to be able to better support all of you within the group. So, um, I'll just uh, start introducing myself. My name is Patricia Lagarza. I'm in Belgium. I've been doing the diet for about 18 years because my child, who was my first child, who was born on the autism spectrum, she's doing really well right now. I'm also, um, I studied, well, I was studying at the university. I worked in the library. And one of the things is that I know how to find information. I was the reference librarian at my university. And if there's one reason why I love to piece these lovely ladies is because they never take things at face value. They're always gonna go look to see if there's science behind it, if there's papers behind it, if there's different opinions behind it and try to compare and contrast and try to come up with the best solution. And uh, Monique is in my camp as well. She's even much better than me because she has a master's in library science. Then uh, Susan, I don't think we need an explanation of you know, how deep into this whole research bit she is. And Carla is a doctorate candidate also on nutrition and working on this, on this whole universe of oxalate. So, um, that's uh, that's me. So I'm just going to continue very quickly to uh, Monique. Okay, so I will do a quick introduction. Um, I'm the newbie of this group. I've only been doing the diet for like 13 and a half years. It'll be 14 in the fall. And um, my background does include some science at an undergraduate level, but uh, Patricia is correct. I have a master's in library and information science. And I am always researching things. My curiosity to find answers, especially after my own children were sick, was what really led me into um, just kind of by accident, oxalate. And my young daughter was the one who was diagnosed with an oxalate problem. I started on the diet. I had nothing that looked like typical oxalate related disease, but I started the diet and I started to get healthier. And then um, like all my antennae went up and I went, what's that? <laughs> and that was the beginning of uh, this journey where I now have two healthy um, children, one 16, one 21, and, uh, and they have a healthy mom. And so this has been Amazing. As a result of finding this diet, I went back and trained as a nutritionist. And so while my, um, my science was mostly my own personal curiosity and my research bent was for my master's in library and in information science, now I have some nutrition training. So now I bring to this hopefully some, some pragmatic experience as somebody doing the diet, but also um, somebody who's now been working with clients to help them reduce the oxalate in their diet and start to regain their health. I'll turn over to, um, to Carla, who is our, our PhD candidate and so um, has definitely into the whole studying of nutrition and, and how it's going to work best for us. Hello, I'm Carla Wersma um, from Colorado. Unlike Monique and Patricia, I came into this with no science background, 20 year Air Force veteran in, in, in a field that you know has absolutely nothing to do with nutrition or you know anything really scientific. 
uh, I came into the diet after my son was diagnosed with autism. Been doing low oxalate for just over 14 years. And my son was really the impetus for me getting involved and then pursuing a degree in nutrition and now a doctorate. The one thing that I found was that it, not only did he need it, but the rest of the family needed it. I mean, I tried it on myself before I tried it on him and, and found that, yeah, I needed the diet just as much as he did. The husband a little bit less so, but you know, almost 15 years later, my son is in great shape. You know, he's, this diet has been such a game changer for him. I, I can't even, you know, begin to, to explain just how much of an impact it's had on him. I also have two foster children. We've been on the diet with them for about two or so years and it's helped them as well. So I don't know what else, really what else to say. That's fabulous. No, and Susan, do you want to introduce yourself for those people that don't know who you are? Yes, well, I'm afraid this whole project started back when I really, before I knew about it, because what I was doing was um, autism research and my big area was sulfate chemistry. And so I was studying neuroscience and what the sulfur and sulfate chemistry would do. And as the science progressed, sulfate was understood to move around the body on the same transporters as oxalate. So then I needed to find out what oxalate was doing and realized when I got into the literature, number one, that the people in the field were absolutely not chasing any of this. And then the, I mean, in the oxalate field and definitely in the autism field, they were not. And so, um, so I started looking at the, the way that the two coordinate and I, I um, had a big meeting in Sydney, Australia, that should have been at 9-11, but that was when nobody could fly, if you remember. And, um, and so I've been at this a long time, but basically I was coming at, at it from the more uh, biochemistry and biology side, just looking at how things move and how they act and how they interact. And so that's still my bent. And I really didn't expect the diet to do anything, but it was the parents like these guys that really convinced me that the diet itself had um, major changes in their lives. And so I'm still pursuing the science side of how everything interacts and all of that. And there is a terrific uh, interplay between what diet does to your biochemistry and what your biochemistry does to your diet and how you absorb it and all of that. So the science side just got so big and our group got so big that um, I was kind of delighted that all of these lovely people got their, their um, children grown up. <laughs> so instead of being so busy doing all the parenthood things, they now are kind of branching out and um, more thinking about what they can do to expand the um, capabilities of a group. And I'm just so pleased to see their initiative and um, getting more audio and video and things like that to be more useful to everybody. Absolutely. And I think some of the, yeah, and some of the improvements that we've had, you know, Carla and I at least, you know, way back when in the autism world where many, many of them were unheard of. So we had growth and we had weight put on and we had, you know, incredible executive function and all these things. But something that was really important as well was that we started, you know, the group was never an autism only group and everybody started learning from each other. So many of us had kids, well, at least I did, that had a nonverbal child at the beginning. And so for me to understand what she was feeling was impossible because she couldn't explain it. And uh, until I started doing the diet as well. 
But then um, when you start hearing people explaining about what, what their feeling was, then everything started making sense. And you could start using those experiences from all sorts of different diagnoses to, um, to help into this one part of knowledge, basically. So that's, um, that's a little bit where the group is. Now, if you come in today and you see, you know, thousand messages <laughs> ever so often from people from all over the place whatever sometimes it's hard to understand what's happening what you know how to make the best for um of all of the information so that's the idea for this particular video so i think can i say, can I say yes. something um i do want to say that it was the science that took us to the broader perspective because we found out that 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 oxalate goes all over the body and then we had to figure out, well, what would it be doing in all those places? And so that's how and why our group expanded to um, take all kinds of diagnoses. And I'm sure that we have passed at least 25 diagnoses that seem to have a basic uh, uh, close relationship to oxalate. So that's why we're such a broad group. Exactly. And now we're going to understand that there's actually like two main areas of study that we're doing. So one of them is the one that Susan is gonna be really concentrating on, which is all of the you know, metabolic biochemistry, hard science, very involved type of um, scientific research. And what we're gonna be involved in, which is actually the implementation of a low oxalate diet. So we're going to be kind of like letting her have a little bit more breathing space by uh, you know, trying to uh, share our experiences and our things that have worked and have not worked because both of them are useful for everybody. And, uh, and let Susan have that breathing space to really concentrate on some of those really complex things that are you know, going around in her research. And uh, now one of the things that I would love to do is uh, Monique is gonna give us a tour of the page because I think one of the things that happens is that many people ask questions because they don't know where to find them. And I think we're gonna make like a little baseline say, you know, video of what the different possibilities are to find the information, where the information store, why is it there? And just, I think it's just gonna give us a very good overview and then we'll just go into the spreadsheet with Carla. All yours, Monique. Okay, let me share my screen so that everybody can see this. Uh, uh, now. Okay, so I'm sharing my desktop. Let me get up the group. So um, I guess I'll have to move things around a little bit so that people can see things. But here is the Triangle Oxalate's main group. I'm gonna have to get my, I'm gonna have to close this down a little bit. Sorry, folks. So that I've got the ability to show you what I'm after. All right. So here we are in our main triangle oxalates group. This is really the hub of how you get into the structure of our um, groups overall. So we have not just this group, but we have what we call subgroups, which will be targeted to certain specific kinds of conversations. But for everybody who wants to start to learn more about triangle oxalates as a diet, approach or about the science, this is where you're going to start out. This is our only group that is, uh, I guess, publicly identifiable. It's not that everything that's on the group is identifiable, but you can find it by doing a search. At the current time, our other subgroups are not available. You can't see them by just doing a search. And um, that's been deliberate so that we know that people come in through this funnel and start to learn about oxalate before they start joining in on more targeted conversations. So this group 
is as Carla or not Carla, as Patricia mentioned, we're over 47,000 members now. So that's part of the reason we're doing this. We want people to kind of understand what, what we're trying to get at with the structure and also with the group itself. We do have um, an about section. So if you're looking at the top of the group, you can see our lovely picture of an oxalate crystal here. And then you've got a number of links and this is to other bits of information that are right on this main group. So we have an about, which allows you to read a little bit what our idea is of what we are. Tells you that the group's private, anyone can find it, but only members can see what's in the group and what's being posted. So that's for everybody's privacy. The discussion, this page gives you some idea of topics that have been tagged. You'll learn more about dumping, but that's a term that we use to describe when oxalate's been stored in the tissues and it gets mobilized. Posts by Susan, which are often going to give you that meatier information about research or other topics are tagged. And we do have a tag member stories so that if you're wanting to understand how other people have come into the group and what, what kind of drove them to think Oxlate might be part of their health playing field, this is where you can go. There are other topics. You can click see all and you'll get a whole list of them. Okay. Now we'll go back to that discussion page because I've that automatically got me into the topics area and away from this discussion page. One of the simplest things though that you can use if you're new to the group and you're trying to find information on a specific question or maybe a specific condition is you can use our handy little magnifying glass and it'll allow you to search the group for and let's say something like dumping. Click enter and here we are at posts where you see the term dumping being used. Now as someone who's a library science person there's a lot of power to be able to do these searches the challenge with Facebook is how it might limit that search. So we want you to be able to search. We want you to consider searching when you've got a question, but we also do know there are some limitations to it. So if you're trying to search a particular term and you're not finding something, you may want to look for specific topics we have tagged or you know, consider, oops, I'm off the group consider um, checking out our guides. Often when a topic is very popular or we have a lot to say about it, we will have a guide set up. So these guides are designed to try and give you some of the background information you'll, you'll need. So we've got the history of the group. There's comments there that are helpful how the overall TLO, triangle low oxalates groups work. This is a great one because it goes into some of this structure that we've built. We try to keep the conversation as targeted and focused as we can. We do have information here on how to get started with the diet. We also have on how to join our subgroups. This will be changing because we're going to try and automate as much of this as possible, where we can ask you really clear questions, ensure that you're a member of the main group, and then have you be able to select the subgroups you want to be part of. Um, in this particular guide on how the subgroups work, we have our rules. We have some information on whether or not you have oxalate as an issue. And we'll be going through some of these posts to clean them up, but you can see that we have basic subgroups listed, TLO, triangle oxalates, spreadsheet, that's our information, TLO, food and recipes, we talk all things, how to eat well, 
TLO Gardening is another of our groups for those of us who want to grow some of their own food and want to be able to do it low oxalate. So those are kind of more generic groups. Then we have groups where we nail and try to focus in on a particular diet. So we have the TLO Vegans group, and we also have the TLO Carnivores group. In addition to those more dietary focused groups, and these are kind of specialist groups because they are very specialized diets where we felt we, we had to have a conversation that was specific to those people. In addition to those, we have groups that have to do with particular conditions. So we have LOD for lichen sclerosis. We have L, a TLO for EDS and hypermobility. We have a TLO autism group. So we don't have a separate group for each condition because we do find that when people cross pollinate and share what's worked for them, regardless of condition, that this can be extremely helpful. So as a mom who had kids, one of whom had breathing issues and the other one had symptoms that looked like vulvodynia at the time, I was actually following the posts of parents with children with autism diagnoses, I was following the posts from adults who had certain conditions, and I was often hearing very helpful information. So don't think that you must narrow down to a condition in order to get good information. There's lots on that main group, but we do have some specialized groups. Last but not least, we have My Pet Project, which is the TLO testing group. And this is because oxalate in foods and the testing of oxalate in foods is still relatively new. While we have the huge spreadsheet that we'll be talking about, that's been Carla's pet project, we, we don't have everything in, available to people out there that's been tested and we want to have more options. So what we've moved towards is an opportunity where people, individuals who have a specific food or product that they want to have tested can actually sponsor those products. That information goes up on our spreadsheet and everybody benefits. So the TLO testing group is where we coordinate that. Um, and that's another one of our specialized groups that you can, that you can join. So note that we do have a number of these groups and all that information about the groups and about questions that are common can be inside our um, guides here. Um, Patricia, do you have something? No, okay. I thought I saw that uh, you were unmuted. Let me go back. We haven't even made it through all of the links that are part of the TLO um, main group. So in addition to the, the discussion, which is questions that people have posted, answers, our guides, which are specific to information that we want to provide to you about structure, about procedure, about dumping, about frequently answer, asked questions, we also have featured posts. And for those of you who have found us this morning, you probably found us through the featured posts. So that may be any of us, Susan, myself, Patricia, or Carla, talking about questions that may have been posted or important things that are coming up, including this morning's session, which was a featured post. When you go to the featured posts, you'll find out things that are going on that might be more current, and we, we have certain kinds of information we include there on our spreadsheet group. That's where the spreadsheet is so that it's easy for you to find. Featured posts, if you're on the discussion page, will be the first posts you see at the top, okay? So as soon as I scroll down past our topics in the group, the rooms, which we haven't really made use of yet, you get your featured posts and then you can click to move through them and see what's tagged for you as important at this point. We do have topics, as I was saying, and under our more tab, you can see members, events, media files, questions, 
We're still exploring what we can do with some of these, but files is a good place for you to be able to go to. In the files section, you will find all kinds of things, not the least of which is articles like this, which list PubMed um, links for certain kinds of diseases. These are often being put together by our indefatigable Annie Flanders, who um, has a wonderful research bent and we love keeping her busy with these kind of questions. So you see there's lots of them here. And if you have a particular condition and you're, you're inclined to wanna see what the research might say, this is a great place to go. There are other things in here um, unfortunately, Facebook does not allow us to have an easy way to structure them. So they are chronological, reverse chronological order. And it's one of those places where your little search button may be helpful if you have a particular interest. On um, the other side here, you'll see that you've got a community home button. That allows you to get from wherever you are. So if you're lost in the group someplace, because there's lots in there, if you hit community home, it'll always take you to this basic landing page. And for those of us, uh, depending upon what your abilities are on the group, for most members, you won't see all of this, but as an administrator, I'm seeing other kinds of options that I have on the group. So that's kind of an overall look. Um, we will probably be developing other subgroups depending upon what the needs are, but those are where we've landed at the moment. The most important ones for the application of the diet will be either, well, one of, one of your food and recipes groups so that you have a place to discuss what kinds of things to eat and recipes which are lower oxalate and your spreadsheet group so you can start to understand both how much oxalates in your diet right now, but also where you might wanna bias your diet in order to reduce that oxalate. So while we may have metabolic issues that can cause us to have too much oxalate being produced from our, you know, from our basic metabolic processes, at the same time, you do not wanna throw fuel on the fire by adding a lot of oxalate to your diet. So we really do uh, wanna encourage people to tackle these uh, moving towards a lower oxalate diet. And there's all kinds of ways to do it. And the spreadsheet's a great tool, which often gets slagged because I think people don't understand how powerful it is. So I want to turn over to um, Carla to talk a bit more about this because it is a fabulous tool and we want people to really understand how you can use it and what it can do for you and maybe clear up some of the areas where it's a little bit confusing when you're first looking at it. So over to you, Carla. Okay. Oh, right before, hold on just a second. Uh, just. Uh, as a general comment, if anybody has questions while Carla is exposing about the spreadsheet, if you could write it down in the comments, I will be monitoring those comments. And then if, you know, at the end of the discussion, we'll be looking to see which ones are like the best or most broad questions to make sure that we answer them. So anything that you have, uh, if you could write it down as a, as a comment, that would be really great. Now I'm giving Carla some powers and Susan wants to say something. I just wanna say that the reason that we did the spreadsheet is because we started to understand that people needed to reduce oxalates slowly because if they didn't do it slowly, then they would have these terrible symptoms that happened as the oxalate that's stored in your body starts to clear. And so the more and more experience we got with this. Now, you know, our, our Facebook group started in 2011, but our group started in 2005 because we were mainly on Yahoo. I mean, that's where we were at first. So, so I want you to know that we've been doing this for since 2005. And so we learned from a lot of people that if you didn't 
didn't slowly reduce like about five to 10% a week was about the maximum to go quickly without avoiding uh, you know, the, the symptoms because we didn't want people to have bad symptoms. And so this is why it became important to count. And the spreadsheet allows us to count because it doesn't matter how weird your diet is, you can find usually whatever you're eating and how much oxalate it has there. So that's it. I'll add one more thing, which is for some people, even five to 10% a week is too much. Um, Susan is very um, accurate when she says some people found that they had very nasty symptoms if they came down too fast. So since I think I've been involved, we've discovered some people are eating thousands of milligrams of oxalate on a daily basis. And for those people, there may be um, even some other kinds of strategies to implement, but no matter no matter how you're coming down, whether you're kind of going up and down as some people kind of do, so come down slowly, but sort of vary or come down 5% a week or whatever you're doing, the spreadsheets, your, your, your place to at least start to understand how much oxalate you're dealing with. And the last thing, and then I'll let Carla talk would be actually the spreadsheet and don't think it is something that's work or something that's terribly complicated. It's actually a way to open the possibilities of food that you can eat. And I think that's really important. I think one of the biggest um, risks of this diet is when you start, you know, eliminating this and this and this and this and this and that, and at the end you end up with ice cubes and lettuce. You know, and I think a good healthy diet is a very varied diet and it's a diet that's also tasty and nice and lovely and, you know, food is something that you share with your family in a very happy way. And the spreadsheet, you should really see it as a way, you know, to broaden those possibilities. So uh, now I'm going to be quiet and we're going to let Carla explain us. Okay. Uh, first off, I'll, I'll, I'll start with what really got me into creating, you know, the spreadsheet, you know, when I first, you know, got into the diet, there was one, I think one website that listed, you know, foods that, that you could have and what, what levels they were at. And it wasn't a real big list. And, you know, there was a lot of foods that, you know, my son wasn't going to be able to eat. I found the low oxalate cookbook too from the VP foundation and found that they actually had some numbers. You know, it wasn't, you know, at, at that point it was more total oxalate as opposed to soluble, but you know, they actually gave you numbers per hundred grams and then per serving size. And I was like, well, wow, this, you know, this opens stuff up a lot, you know, mainly because you could see, you know, certain items were low, but at the high range of low. So, you know, you could have, you know, a half cup of that, but if you had a cup and a half, you know, your diet is now not really low oxalate. So I, I decided, you know, let's let's compile this stuff. Let's get it out to the group. I had talked with members from the VP Foundation, who said, yeah, you know, as long as you as long as you keep the data in house, and you're not trying to make money off the data, go ahead and use it. And so I did. I initially posted it as a bunch of Word documents, and you know, for each category that the book had, and then decided, you know, this was just too much of a pain to keep up, you know, updating 10, 12 documents. So I put it into the Excel spreadsheet and then converted it to, to PDF so folks could have different, you know, different formats because not everybody uses Word. Some people, you know, use Mac, you know, that uses numbers. 
I don't have, you know, I don't have a Mac other than my iPhone. So, you know, that was the goal. You know, initially it was, I think, two, 300 items, you know, and now it's like a couple thousand. So it's, it's grown into a behemoth. Yes. Did you have something, Patricia? 3,800 and something. Yeah. So it's, I realize folks have a love-hate relationship with it. I have a love-hate relationship with it. It's, it's kind of hard to maintain because there's a lot of data. There's a lot of different, different references. You have, you know, some items that are listed multiple times, either because you have different serving sizes. So, you know, where I can, if, you know, a half cup of something may be high, but a quarter cup may be, you know, maybe medium, medium, and you can put that into your diet. Or if you soak it, you know, like with grains or with some vegetables, you know, you'll find that something that had a lot of, of soluble oxalate, you know, if you soak it and toss the water out, you know, suddenly you've got something that that's quite doable, you know, for the diet. The other reason that we have multiple items or one item listed multiple times, especially with produce, is because they're grown in different areas and environmental factors, you know, come into play. So one of the things that, that we found was spices and herbs that were grown in Massachusetts were at a different oxalate level as some grown in South Carolina. So with produce, especially with produce, you have to, to take that into account. You know, a strawberry in Cali grown in California may not be the same as a strawberry grown in Texas, you know, based on the soil conditions and other environmental factors. So it's not really, you're not going to get one, one reading that covers everything. But it's still, you know, it, it's still a helpful tool. Any questions? I'll just add like you, Carla, that, it, you know, there are times when I use a food in a smaller serving and I'll think of things in what I call condiment size servings yep. because it's about staying under your threshold for oxalate. It's not about an all or nothing. So you can do this diet by just focusing all on low oxalate foods and that works for people. But you can also do this diet in a way where we're maybe a bit more nuanced, where I'm looking at the oxalate per serving of a more complicated dish with multiple ingredients, or I'm looking at oxalate on my plate. Um, and so I might have one of our favorite ones is like, we'll have something like a steak and maybe we've got white rice with it, but we have steamed broccoli but we have lots of steamed broccoli and steamed broccoli will be a bit um, more medium in oxalate. And especially if you're eating a larger serving of it, you might be taking in more oxalate than you think, but it works quite fine if you think of having like an oxalate budget for your plate. Um, and even if somebody wants to stay low oxalate, that budget's gonna give them, depending on whether you eat snacks or not, 15 or 20 milligrams per meal. So yeah just another way for, for, for people to start thinking with a bit more flexibility about, um, you know, about how they're handling their diet. Yep. Another thing that I found is, is, and that I've added is research studies, because that's where, you know, a lot of our data comes from, not just the testing from Dr. Liebman through the University of Wyoming, but also the Harvard food list. And one of the things that I found on, especially with the Yahoo group, was that there were a lot of folks that were using the spreadsheet 
we're using the studies and also using the Harvard food list to, to kind of rack and stack and see where there were commonalities. So that's one reason why I've, I, I included that into the spreadsheet was so, you know, if you don't want to just use the spreadsheet, but you want to use data from other, from other areas, you can see, okay, the Harvard food list and this study says that white rice is low. You know, and you know, okay, blueberries are kind of all over the map. So maybe I wanna, you know, to limit how much of those I use. But a lot of folks, you know, do it that way. You know, they want more than one, one source to use to base their decisions on. And there's nothing wrong with that. So if I decided it was, you know, probably not a bad idea to throw it in because there, there were a lot of members that were actually using that Harvard data in conjunction with the rest of the data that's in this. Carla, that's in the, Susan wanted to say something. I just wanted to say you have to kind of know yourself. If you're somebody that can say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to count the total amount for this meal. And I'm going to have one little piece of chocolate in here or something like that. And you know you can do that, then that's great. But if you get a little bit of chocolate and you think, oh, well, I can do more chocolate and more chocolate and more chocolate, you have to know yourself. So some people are different the way they handle things. And there are some people who just want to just say, tell me the foods I can eat and tell me the foods I can't eat. And so if you're doing that, then you might, you know, want to be really paying attention to the L's, the low, low oxalate things. But some of us, you know, really like more flexibility. And so maybe we're, we're going to watch our recipes and see how much there is of this item versus that item and do the math and get a, get a scale and measure things, you know, on the, the weight. And that's really good for, um, uh, like leafy things, because, you know, what is a cup of lettuce, you know, doesn't make any sense. Some things you just really have to weigh. And that's why we also have the weight uh, there and the volume there. So you can kind of go either direction. No, that, that's true. One of the things that, that I started out with was just serving size. I mean, half cup, half cup, quarter cup, that was that was all I went. But then I found, like you said, with produce, that can get a little bit tricky. So I basically, when it comes to, you know, grains like rice, oats, you know, even legumes like uh, lentils or, or, or peas, I'll do a half cup. But when it comes to things like lettuce, you know, broccoli, cauliflower, you know, some of the the items that are a little harder to stuff into a half cup, I go with with the weight. And you know, a small digital scale, you know, it it works. And then, you know, eventually you do it enough, you can look and say, okay, you know, I now know what a half cup, you know, looks like. So, you know, you can do the by hand method, you know, like they do with with protein. And you know you don't need to necessarily use the scale, but it's a it's a good tool. So we use a little bit of both. And I really started out with the half cup serving because my brain didn't want to calculate things. So for those of you who are new to oxalate, know that there are those of us who approach this like slowly and without all sorts of complexity at least to start because we you know you're you're kind of getting your feet wet so um when i was first doing this i tried to bias my diet as much to low and kind of lower foods and i would have a little bit of medium oxalate foods and i i kind of eyeballed servings because i just wasn't ready to do math to try and figure out what I was eating. So 
there there's more than one way to skin the oxalate cat, so to speak. Absolutely. So Carla, we're ready to go and dive in. Okay. Let me see if I can sh share my uh my screen here. Okay, does everyone see the spreadsheet? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So this is how we started it out. You know, basically you have your categories, you know, which can be, you know, dairy, basic items, you know, baking items like, uh, you know, baking soda, baking powder, salt. You have fruits, beverages, grains it's the spreadsheet ha has gone through a, a number of changes we've tried to make it a little more user friendly so that you know all your grains are in one item your your legumes are in another item and we have a couple different formats what i've got right now is uh, a cons the consolidated one, but we also have one that's tabbed by category. And I'll see if I can bring that. Let me see if I can bring that one up too. Uh, maybe not. Oh well. We'll leave it for consolidated at the moment. So we do the dairy, we do the calc level, which is basically automated. And it takes the the total oxalate for 100 grams soluble and the serving size the weight and it calculates your oxalate per serving would it be possible that you zoom the screen a little bit so that it's bigger because it's kind of small or at least for those of us that wear glasses okay oh, there you that's beautiful that's so much better Okay, sorry. <laughs> and uh, just, uh, if I may, just uh, adding, you know, that whole soluble oxalate and non-soluble oxalate, I think that's something that's really, really important for people to get into their heads. Because actually, when you say that there's a percentage of soluble oxalate, that means that that's the oxalate that if you boil it, for example, it would stay in the water. And the insoluble is the one that is going to stay in the food. So this is all a lot of very relatively recent knowledge. So there's still a lot of people that say, oh, if you soak almonds, you know, it, they're okay. There's no, there's no issue. But if you see how much soluble oxalate is in almonds, you're going to know that there's still a considerable amount that's going to stay in the almond. And whereas if most of your oxalate is soluble, you can be pretty sure that by doing a cooking process that makes this um, oxalate dissolve in water, and then you can throw the water away, then all of a sudden you have foods that you can use. It, it definitely increases, increases your options. It gives you more food options. And that's the, the one thing that I love the most about this spreadsheet was that it, it really enabled me to give my kid more eating options. And kids on the spectrum tend to have sometimes uh, selective eating, you know, the, some kids can be food restricted and I didn't want my kid to go down that, that path. I wanted him to have as many options as he could have. So, you know, enough said about that, but back to the, the spreadsheet, we have our items. Uh, one thing to note when you send an item in for testing, the more information that you can give 
Dr. Liebman and the folks doing the testing, the more information I can put into the food list. So if you're sending in, you know, rice, you know, what brand, you know, are there specific cooking instructions? You know, if you're sending in produce and you want it baked, you know, do you want the food soaked first? Do you want, you know, how much did you, did you use? What temperature did you bake it at? You know, how long did you bake it? If you sent in items that were soaked, how long did you soak it? And what did you do with the soaking water? You know, did you soak it for 24 hours? Did you soak it for 12? Did you cook it in the water that you soaked it in? Or, you know, did you cook it and, you know, toss the, toss the water out or in cook it in fresh water? So the more information you can give about the item, you know, the better will be because, you know, if, if you say, I just sent in strawberries, you know, strawberries from, you know, from where? And is, was there a specific variety? And if you know that information, you know, like I said, the more that you can provide, the better. A lot of times, especially with, with some of the VP updates, we don't get that with, with the produce. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Like the tomato section, you know, the VP guys went all out. And, you know, we've got 10 to 12 different varieties of, of tomatoes and, and green beans that were sent in. But then, you know, other times, you know, they've tested papaya and papaya's got like, you know, 10 to 15 different, different varieties. So to just say, or with potatoes, to just say I sent in a potato doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't help us. So the more information that you can, you can give the better. Uh, the next column is the total oxalate per 100 gram. And a lot of people use that as their, their starting point. You know, that's what, you know, that, that's what they're going to use to determine, you know, what they're going to, what they're going to have. They're not even going to look at the serving size or the servings, you know, per gram. Again, the next one is the total soluble oxalate. And Patricia and Monique have both talked about this. And for me, that's, go ahead, Susan. I just wanted to say one thing you have to be careful if you're using lists from other places is that not everybody defines low, medium, high the same. And so we, I think, do you still have at the, at the top of the sheet, like how our, what our definition is of those? In the general info, the general oh, info. Oh, in the general info. info. Oh, okay. So that's really important. You cannot just take a list from somebody and said, oh, they said it was low and, and expect that you know anything because you have to look anywhere you get a designation of low, medium, or high, you need to see what their definition was. Yes. And I, I believe the Harvard food list does that a little bit with their, what they, what they consider low, medium and high are, are not, don't always line necessarily line up. But uh, total soluble oxalate, that's a good, A good thing to look at, especially for grains and some vegetables and other, you know, other produce. You know, because like Patricia said, what may be high, and we found this with like wild rice and and brown rice, it's medium to high when you cook it as is, but you soak it overnight, throw the soaking water out, cook it. And I tend to cook stuff like that, like pasta. 
you know, lots of water and then just toss the rest of that water out. And, you know, brown rice is, is low that way. And wild rice is borderline low medium. So, you know, those things are, are doable, you know, within the diet, if, you know, if you want to do that. So, you know, it can be helpful. Serving size, pretty self-explanatory. Servings in gram. So if in grams, so if you don't want to, to necessarily use, you know, a measuring cup or measuring spoons, you know, break out your scale and those are the numbers you would use. And then your oxalate per serving and the soluble oxalate per serving. And let me see if I can unhide this. And then you have your percentage. One of the things that I found is even when it says it's 100% soluble, it's not 100% soluble. You're not going to, to get rid of all of the, the oxalate, especially you know, with the grains. But you, know, you might be able to, to look at that in and decide, okay, I can use, you know, brown rice is something I might want to add to the, the menu because there's greater than 50% soluble oxalate. So, hey, if, you know, if I soak it and then toss the water out and cook it, it's doable. I'm, I'm removing a, a good portion, you know, of the oxalate so I can, I can put this into my, into my diet. And then the reference, and one of the things that I added was the note section. And it was for, for me, a good place for substitutions. You know, if I can't use spinach, what are some good alternatives? If I can't, you know, use almond butter, is there a low or a medium nut butter that I can use? So that was, you know, essentially what that section was for. So it's, it is a bit of a, of a behemoth, but there's, there's plenty of things that you can, you can do with it and, and make it work for you. I apologize. I've been typing a bit in the background. So you guys have probably been hearing me. I was answering the odd question on the chat. But there's some interest in um, how items get tested. And that's this will be my plug for the TLO testing group. Um, previously, uh, what little money this group was able to get in terms of donation, like the TLO uh, main group, the Triangle Oxlux group, some of that was applied to testing foods. Um, but that really kept us limited. And it also meant some of the money which was being designated for Susan's autism oxalate project was actually going towards testing foods as opposed to going towards Susan's autism oxalate project and some of her activities. So what we've gone to is a methodology where um, we have a, a, a group of people who may be interested in testing a particular food. So I'll give you a great example. Last time we did testing, I was really interested in getting some dry grains tested. Why dry and not cooked? I wanted to be able to add them dry to something like a, a casserole or a soup or whatever and understand exactly how much oxalate was present in that food before it was cooked. So the testing group now handles some of these things. I often have my own special project of one kind or another where we're trying to collect more data on certain kinds of foods where we may not have a pattern in the data. And so we're a little confused about perhaps how high or low a food might be, or if you know, we know enough about uh, a, you know, variety or whatever to be able to recommend a variety. Sometimes we're we're looking for patterns in the data that we don't have yet. 
Um, and sometimes people join and say, I would just really like to have this product tested because it's something that they're eating as a family and they want to include it. And so what we really do is allow people to send in foods, um, be part of a batch of testing, and then they pay for those foods to be tested. So that charge currently is at $65 per test that's being done. Um, Dr. Michael Liebman, who is an oxalate researcher and is a professor emeritus, somewhat retired, but still access to his lab, is the one who does that testing for us. He is a gem. Um, we do probably three batches a year, give or take now. And what I'm hoping is that over time, we can start to have a more comprehensive list. We're never going to be able to test everything in the world, but hopefully we start to have more patterns in the data so that we can more likely predict whether or not a food is going to be okay for you or not. And, you know, this is one of the places where people can be helping everyone else on the group by volunteering to like send in a sample, volunteering to pay for a sample if they don't have a particular sample they want to send in or can sponsor a food themselves or can be part of one of my special projects. And we are slowly making sure that our data is built out and gives us more bang for the buck by doing this. So that is one of the ways where new data is turning up on our spreadsheet. And that data is data that we're able to share freely because we're not, we're not restricted by copyright. So I think, I think Carla mentioned that some of the data on our spreadsheet is data that's actually owned by other organizations. The Harvard list is public. We don't have to worry about that data, but there is data on our spreadsheet, which belongs to the Volver Payne Foundation, where we've been given permission to use it. Please do not share our spreadsheet as a result because that is copyrighted data. And to whatever extent we can you know, end up testing some of the same foods that the Volver Pain Foundation has tested so that we have our own data point, we will hopefully at some point have something that is, you know, available and no longer covered completely by copyright so that, you know, we have, we have a tool that we can share um, more freely. So the TLO testing group is slowly plugging away at some of these things and, if you're interested in supporting us, uh, we'd be more than happy to have you on the group. Any questions? <laughs> I wanted to share something, if uh, if I could, and I'll just take a couple of minutes. You know, um, they the two lovely ladies there were talking that they work on cups. I don't work on cups. I work on grams. I weigh everything because I just find it easier to do. What I do is that I just have um, a waste cup there in next to my kitchen and I just grab with my hand whatever it is that I'm going to put in the pan and then just see how much it is. And I just put it directly into a spreadsheet that I made and I'm just going to show you something that I've done already for a little boy. And then you see how it's very easy to calculate and what I usually do. I've been doing this a long time. So I have like my recipes and that's the, that's the beauty of this thing is the things that you've been eating all the time. You calculate them once and then you know, you know how you cook it and what your proportions are and whatever. So you already have a pretty good idea of where you are oxalate wise. And then you can start mixing and matching you know, and start getting your longer term menus and your rotation if you're doing that or, or whatever, always keeping control. And I found that was very, very useful. We uh, joined the Oxalate project with the second group of parents with kids on the spectrum from Susan. So we're there since the very beginning. And we had no idea we had to do it slowly. And this is before even Google's existed. So just to give you an idea, 
And so doing it like that just made it very easy to have like your own personal cookbook with levels, so to speak. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm just going to share, you know, just an, an example that I made for a family. And basically what, what we did is, well, this one is in Spanish, but um, so this is actually something that the family is eating right now. And I was just showing them, you know, what it means oxalate wise. So for breakfast, this particular kid was having a cocoa, um, coconut milk with cocoa and uh, amaranth as uh, breakfast, which everybody was probably going, oh, this is high and extremely high. These people are just starting their journey. So they don't know what, you know, if something's good or not. And I think this is a very good example to know where to start. So find out first where you are now, and then you start going lower. So basically what I do is that I just take the ingredients of this particular food. I just mark it in a different color so that I know that's a recipe. And this is for breakfast. So I put the coconut milk, the cocoa powder, and the amaranth. And I just copied the entire line of text from uh, Carla's spreadsheet. So I just copied, I just basically copied it from the other spreadsheet, pasted it here, you know, all the way to notes. And then here I have my own calculation, which is how much of this stuff are you giving? So I put 20, 240 grams. So that's like a large cup of um, coconut milk, five grams of um, cocoa, and then 100 grams of amaranth. And then that gives me, you know, how many oxalates it is for this particular food. And I could make subtotals and things like that. And then I already know what's happening to this particular, uh, you know, child in this case, this particular family. And then they see where their biggest source of oxalate is right now. And it is from that step that they start lowering it. So in this particular example, so what we started doing is that we started cutting the amaranth. We started cutting the amaranth, but we didn't cut the amaranth. We started reducing the portion of amaranth. So here, if we say, okay, now we're going to do, you know, instead of 100 grams, just do 80. And then what happens? You start lowering your oxalate level. And then you're going to go to 50. And then you're going to go to 40 up until you reduce it completely. And then you can start, you know, with some of the other things. And we did that for the entire day. So for whatever it is that he was eating. So, you know, when he's eating, well, this is Mexican kid, he's eating tacos, of course. So, um, so you start seeing corn tortillas and chicken and carrots and cucumbers and everything that meant what that taco in that family was. Copy and paste everything exactly from the spreadsheet and just make your own calculation. If you want to, I can just put this one also in the files of the group because I think the other point that is really important is that we do not touch the basic database because if we ever make a mistake, we copy and paste something, this is the baby that Carla has dedicated years of her life so I feel much better just copying and pasting into my own database. If there's a problem, I can always go back to the correct source of information. So I think that is, yes, Susan. Oh, you can just, no, you can just uh, unmute yourself. I have found it very helpful for people who, you know, look at 3,000 items and like freak out. Um, if you can make a copy of the spreadsheet into a new spreadsheet, it's just yours, and then add a column and on that column say things that I would eat, things that I do eat, things that um, I won't ever eat, you know, that kind of thing. And then you can sort by that column and make a smaller spreadsheet of just the things that are relevant to you. And then you can copy that whole part 
into a new spreadsheet, and then you don't have to use the huge spreadsheet all the time. I mean, you go refer to it if you're going to introduce a new food or something like that. But on every day level, you don't need to deal with something that's so huge. Yeah, that's a great idea. Actually, I find this 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 setup for me was very useful because I could have like my own recipes so that I knew that if I was making tinga de pollo, that represented so much. And that becomes kind of like my own my own recipe book with levels, so to speak. So that was what was really, really useful for it. So that was just a, you know, a little simple, simple thing to do. And then we also make sure that Carla's database is kept pristine, <laughs> you know, and nobody's touching it. And um, if I can jump in a little, when I started this, I was so brain fogged. I was so unwell. I had um very little energy and so i wasn't necessarily making dishes per se i was cooking individual foods and i think that's another way that you can that you can come at this but i i did something similar to what susan's talking about but what i did was i only took i took the name of the food i took what i considered the best data point i had at that point in time and i made some little notes for myself so it was three columns and i reproduced it in word and i had 20 pages that i could print out and i took that thing with me and so i think what we're saying here is there's more than one way to skin this cat but for sure um I was really wanting something simpler as well. And one of the ways that worked for me was I just went down to the name of the food. The serving size was half a cup because I just wasn't ready to deal with the, you know, what, what's involved in measuring things more carefully. And I went to really, really simple approaches in terms of recipes. So I might make a stir fry, but I'm going to use a base of cabbage. And then I was going to use some garlic and I was going to use, um, you know, maybe I was going to throw in a little broccoli for color and a little red pepper for color, but I knew that everything was low enough that I didn't have to count that. So for those who, you know, might be starting in that place, I did eventually work out a kind of approach that might work for others. And it's, relatively simple if you've got the whole spreadsheet and you're willing to like do little ticks on a page just to keep track of your servings but what i did was say if something was in the very low category or zero i'm not counting it i would feed it to my family i didn't count it i started to count if something was low so that was between kind of two milligrams of oxalate and 4.9 milligrams of oxalate on the spreadsheet and i and I said to myself, okay, three to five of those will work. But then I wanted to keep some variety in. So Carla's talked a little bit about this and certainly Patricia's approach fits for here too. And I said, okay, if something's five to about seven and a half milligrams of oxalate, I'm gonna allow two or three of those a day. So maybe that's one per meal per plate. And if something's between that seven and a half and maybe 10 or 11, Maybe they could have one of the one serving of those a day. And if you work it out, like if you keep track in that kind of way based on a rating from our ratings anyway, um, and using the standard serving size, you're gonna come in around 60. You might sometimes float a little bit higher than 60. You might be a little bit lower, but it worked pretty well for me. So I, still kind of do that on a on a daily basis when i'm cooking it's like okay how many mediums have they had did i serve them potatoes today because that's one of those ones where my family loves them and they're a little bit higher in oxalate um you know do they want brussels sprouts for supper like so that i'm allowing for some of those more medium oxalate foods that my family likes but i'm kind of spreading it out over the day and i'm uh not having to track everything so despite the fact that i'm actually a nutritionist i hate tracking and so that was the that was my solution to it i did something slightly different <clears throat> pardon me but this was more to get 
my family a little more active into the diet as opposed to me saying this is what you're going to eat it was a, a good way to teach my son about the diet and get his get his buy-in so that he understood you know i can't really be eating peanut butter you know because peanut butter cookies ouch so i did two week meal plans and i would tell the you know tell the kid and tell the husband pick out you know meals that you want me to convert to low oxalate or to medium oxalate and we did so i would create recipes put you know put the numbers in and you know this is you know medium per serving or you know, this is very low per serving. So, you know, I could throw in one that was, you know, maybe a little closer to high and, and, and still meet all the numbers. So like Monique said, there's, there's a variety of ways to skin this cat. And it worked, like I said, it worked really well for my family because one, it got the husband's buy-in because he could still have some of the foods, you know, that he liked. He's, kind of a meat and potatoes guy and we all know how potatoes can be kind of disastrous and the kid who was gluten free and dairy free and low oxalate you know would give me some some good challenges you know can can you make me low oxalate and dairy free goldfish you know stuff like that you know I can't have chocolate can you can you make me some low oxalate brownies that kind of sort of taste like chocolate? That kind of stuff. And that was a huge, that was a huge benefit for him. You know, one of the things, the best things is I don't worry about, and I didn't worry about after one or two minor disasters with him, you know, that, that he would cheat. You know, he had the whole week pancakes, the triple stack, and and went through serious pain. He had, you know, the grandma-sized peanut butter cookies. And after one or two episodes of that, you know, he figured out, yeah, that ain't a whole lot of fun. So he would, you know, when they had stuff going on at school, he, he would ask, is that gluten-free? Is that dairy-free? Ooh, can't have blackberries. You know, let me let me call my mom and see whether I can have these or these low oxalate or not, you know, it is, is this doable? So it, you know, it got his buy-in and that was, it was worth all the, you know, let's, let's see if I can make this low oxalate just to, to teach him that, you know, it's not as, it's not as difficult, you know, as you make it, you don't have to deprive yourself there. There are plenty of ways to do it. Yeah, same here. We converted as many recipes as possible for family favorites to low oxalate. It, I just took my time at it. I saw Susan. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, it's really important to get family buy-in. And I, that was a lovely thing that you said, Carla, because especially as your kids uh, get older, maybe, maybe you feel you can kind of, you know, arrange everything and they don't think about it when they're little, but as they get to be teenagers and older, you have got to get it to where they own it or else you're going to be heading into a disaster. No, and it, it, it's, it's true. If, if they're not going to buy into it, what's, you know, what's the point? If it's not a diet that they can, that they can do in you know, this, I apply this to, to other diets, you know, I, I'll never be a vegan and I'll never be a carnivore because, you know, I love my vegetables, but at the same time, I love cow. So, <laughs> and, and if it's not a diet that you're going to, to stick with and, and make it work for you, then what's the point? So, and, and that was the big thing, you know, with my son, 
you know, he's not big on, he has a fear of the stove and the oven after burning himself in class once. That wasn't a whole lot of fun. So I've tried to give him alternatives, you know, low oxalate using the microwave. You know, we have a ton of microwave recipes. We have a ton of crock pot recipes. We have a, a ton of instant pot recipes. You know, things that, that he'll use in, instead of, you know, the oven, which, you know, I'm still five years later getting him back in, into using. But again, if he's not going to use the oven, you know, what's again what's what's the point i have to be able to to get him to do to do the diet with the tools that he will use so yeah. you know there's there's tons of flexibility absolutely and with that ladies i don't know if you realize but we've been at it for almost an hour and a half so we're going to be closing down the zoom we're going to be putting it on our brand new YouTube uh, page so that everybody can see it. And uh, we would like to invite you to next week, same time, we're going to have a session of Ask Me Anything. So we would like, if possible, if you could send us the questions beforehand, you can send them, you know, as a message, as a private message to... Uh, Patricia, Carla, or Monique, don't send questions to Susan, please. Susan's busy enough as it is. But um, to the three of us, if you want to have any question asked, we will do our best to uh, respond it. Or if we don't know, then we'll try to find out about it. So it's going to be an open question sessions. And uh, we can, you can send them, yes, Kelly, you can, we can send them also to the email with this lowoxproject at gmail.com. And, um, and we can see then all of you next, uh, next week, same time, 10 a.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Europe, and um, ask us anything. Okay, thank you everyone. It's been great to kick off today and uh, you'll be hearing more from us. And thank you for the kind comments that I'm seeing happen in the chat. Yes, they're it's great to get started. Yep. Afterwards at the, at the YouTube channel. So thank you so much. We hope it was useful. And, uh, and if you have any ideas of topics that we could be covering the next Mondays, please let us know. Some of the ideas that we were thinking about were things like uh, my best recipe or my best substitution or you know how to recipe hack or how to calculate this whole thing or best birthday cake that's low oxalate and gluten-free and whatever so um any ideas that you have just let us know we'll just try to make this as useful as possible okay thank you thank yeah thanks everyone thank you for coming we'll we'll close the zoom now <laughs>